Hi folks, how y'all doing? Um, so I'm Patrick Prince, I'm Associate Vice Provost and Chief Threat Officer. And uh, um, I'm primarily located at uh, UPC, but uh, joining me today is, is uh, or maybe I'm joining her, is Kelly Busta, who um, is actually embedded in our health science campus there um, at Keck. And so uh, we're very appreciative of y'all being here. And um, we, we have a couple things we'd like to do. One is um, I, I wanna take the first few minutes and, and describe how our office came to be, our role with the university, but also give you some background uh, about the field. Um, you know, we're looking at it and I think uh, one of the seminal pieces of literature in, in our business uh, really only came about uh, in the last uh, 24, 25 years. So we're a fairly new field. Uh, we're gonna talk about some cases, um, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, gonna talk about how we got here. So some of the, the issues are, are um, powerful. Um, we, we, uh, we deal with domestic uh, abuse, we deal with stalking, we deal with um, assaults uh, of all kinds. So just uh, be aware that there are resources available for you. And, and if this is difficult, uh, we understand if you just wanna mute for a minute or two or, or do what you need to take care of yourself. And we also certainly wanna take advantage of the, uh, the Care for the Caregiver program that we have there at HSC. So for that, um, my office, uh, the Office of Threat Assessment Management was uh, brought aboard and, and created in 2017. So we're pretty new. And uh, we uh, were created in the um, aftermath of one of our faculty members who was murdered. We had a faculty member murdered at UPC in December of 2016, Dr. Bosco John. And the university took a real hard look at itself, look at its programs, look at what resources that we had. And obviously what we want to do is, is learn from where we've come and, and take real specific steps to make sure we, we, we uh, address things better if we're to come about. So again, uh, my office was designed to provide collaborative, uh, proactive oversight and support throughout the university enterprise in identifying, assessing and managing threats or threatening behavior, which may lead to acts of targeted violence against anyone within our USC community. Um, and I think the, the real key here is that we want to be proactive we want to be involved early, and we'll talk a lot about that. And Kelly, especially uh, as she starts to describe how you can best to communicate and uh, with her to uh, bring her on board and and get her to participate early in processes. But we also want to collaborate. We we don't swoop in and grab cases. We don't report uh, through DPS, for example. I report directly to the provost, and that allows us the opportunity to move uh, pretty quickly. And uh, I think we are able to um, be very supportive in, in the steps that we take. Um, our guiding principle, if you will, uh, and, and I think it, it really does fit not just within our, our USC values, but I think it fits within the health science framework, is that we really believe that violence prevention is more than just the deterrence of physical harm. It, it truly involves a restoration of, of health, well-being, uh, not just for the individual who may be creating concern, uh, but for all those folks that they may be impacting as well. And um, hang on a second. Um, so anyways, we really want to be available and, and help uh, folks throughout the process. The individual is creating concern, but the people that they're impacting. So uh, we, we, we really do believe that the earlier we're involved, the more successful we are in our interventions as well as, as the more, um, I, I think, broad we're able to, to be in, in guiding. So um, a, a couple of, of notions. Um, when we look at folks who historically have been involved in, in, in positions like Kelly's and mine, um, we, we find that uh, they often are, are brought in at late stage. Uh, when I first started, I, I was asked, you know, so we call you when somebody's making threats. And I said, well, we'll take that call. But we really want to get involved much earlier because there's a couple of real important lessons that we want to share with you that, that we know uh, are not only are true, but, but the data is, is just really powerful and supportive. And the first is that no one just snaps. Um, it, it really has never happened. It never will. People um, don't just snap. When we look at targeted violence, we'll talk a lot more about what that specifically means. It's generally the end of a long pattern of behavior. People know what's coming. Uh, and despite what we hear in the media, there's very few surprises. Now, there may be a surprise to, to the, the 
the focus of their attention. Um, but uh, there, there's truly what we find is, is a, a very identifiable, predictable buildup. Um, I live in Nashville, and as you would expect, uh, the, the shooting that we had at the, the school uh, last Monday has gotten a lot of attention. And as we're learning more about it, uh, this person had been um, talking with peers, uh, talking with other folks for months. Um, again, no one just snapped. What that lets us know as well, then there's many opportunities to intervene. And there's ways that not only can prevent violence from occurring, but we can hopefully then uh, assist that person who is moving into that pathway to violence, who is losing or otherwise uh, cutting short opportunities and resources. Um, what we have found is that, uh, and, and between us, Kelly and I have worked thousands of cases over many, many years, is that people don't want to, to come in and engage in these horrific acts of violence, at least not at first. And what we'll find is that they've engaged maybe unsuccessfully and maybe somewhat impotently uh, other opportunities and resources. But if we can intervene meaningfully early enough, we can redirect, um, we can help assist because there's opportunities to intervene that have been available throughout the process. Another challenge though, is that very few things are as they're first reported. Um, we, we get calls every day. Our office here at USC um, in, in this fiscal year will probably uh, handle a little over 370 cases. So every day we get a new case. Some cases are very short, um, uh, very easy to intervene, very easy to work with uh, other partners. Uh, some are incredibly labor intensive and, um, and, and resource draining and some never seem to go away. But what we always have been is that a piece of information comes forward. It takes um, a, a lot of patience. It takes a lot of thought to catch our breath, not knee jerk, but to, to react in a really kind of thoughtful manner to find out what is going on. How did we get here? What else is happening? Um, and, and these kinds of things just make sense. But in the world of threat assessment, uh, when we're fearful, we, we tend to focus really on, on very short-term issues and short-term resolutions. And that, that's not how our office is going to handle. Um, some other uh, lessons that we've learned is, is, again, that not all warnings or red flags are equal. Now, all should be taken seriously, but we don't get really hung up on this, this I think, crazy notion about the zero tolerance. Um, because what has happened when zero tolerance turned into zero judgment, then it really harmed us and it didn't, it didn't serve anyone. Um, for example, we, we've all been at a market and we've heard a parent yell at a child, you know, if you pick up any more candy, I'll kill you. Now, it's probably not good parenting. It's probably an appropriate comment, but that's different from the person who is angry that they, they, they feel that their family member um, uh, didn't get the care they wanted the outcome they were seeking. And they say, if, if something doesn't change, I'll kill you. On paper, they're identical, but everybody on this call knows that they're different. And the, the, the fundamental challenge for everyone, not just people reporting concerns, but us in assessing risk and for intervention uh, planning, we all need to catch our breath and understand what's really going on and not just jump and run. I'm not talking about taking days and weeks off. I'm taking taking moments to catch our breath and really understand what's going on. And quite frankly, everything deserves an intervention. Not all interventions should be equal. We have to match our intervention to that situation. And we really believe and we know that targeted violence occurs within a context. And violence prevention must address both that individual and that in, in that environment around that individual. Many years ago, I was working um, uh, and consulting with a, a public utility, and there was a fella who worked on a crew, and um, he did not look like the other people in the crew. He did not listen to the same radio stations. He certainly didn't vote the same way they did, and, and, and people on the crew messed with him, and they would hide his work orders. They would uh, steal his tools. They, they, they messed with this guy. They even flattened the tires on his truck one day. And one day out in the desert, the, the fella took out a, a gun and he fired six rounds off into the ground. And he said, leave me alone. As we would expect, the other folks left him alone. Uh, they reported this through their chain of command, kind of like our policies. And we like, you know, 
chain of command. I think it, it helps us make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, it got to the point where very quickly I was contacted and they flew me out in a helicopter to the desert to do a risk of violence assessment. Now, only knowing what you know, which is obviously not enough, but it's all you have, was I going to find him to be low, moderate, or high? This is the FBI typology. We've adopted it. Low, moderate, or high. Now, some folks say, well, he fired a gun off. He's high risk. But in that moment, and for the foreseeable future, he's actually low risk for two very important reasons. Number one, if he wanted to kill people, he, he could have. He's chosen not to and demonstrated in a rather significant way he doesn't want to. And maybe more importantly, number two, they're leaving him alone. But let's say you put that person back on the crew and let's say they start to mess with him again. Let's say they start to treat him unfairly. Now what's our risk? And as many of you know, the risk is out the roof. It, a couple of, of points here. Risk is not static. Risk of violence is not a character trait. It's not a genetic predisposition. It's an individual within an environment. And granted, for some people, a lot of the environment is intrapsychic. It, it, it's within their own mind, within their own life history. Um, but, but it is an environment and it is impacted by the community around them. And the other thing is it tells us is that there's opportunities to intervene. And because somebody does something that's extremely, in my opinion, inappropriate, unconscionable, unacceptable, it's not okay to fire off that gun. A lot of us say, I understand how we got there. Now we can start looking at how we address it. One of the interesting challenges I thought was that um, uh, as I articulated my position and several of the people on the crew, right, reasonably, I think, said, well, wait a minute, he fired a gun. He's extremely dangerous. I said, there's two very different issues here. One, is he in this moment still dangerous? No. Might he be in the future? Of course. So we need to be careful and thoughtful in what we do. But if we want to really address his risk, we need to understand that what he did was wrong. Let's hold him accountable. But we need to look at the totality because if he felt he was being treated unfairly, and let's say we fire him, we can do that. We can terminate patient's care. We can do all kinds of things. Did we serve us or did we make it worse? In his case, I think if they'd fired him, they would have made it worse. Now, they gave him significant discipline, which he deserved. They gave his foreman discipline because he was aware of the issues. He gave the, the co-workers discipline. Everyone had an impact. But what it really comes back to tell us this is when Kelly or I get involved in a situation, we want to know as much as we can. We call it the backstory. How do we get here? What's the context? And what we then know is as we create interventions, we're going to create an invention for that person concerned. We're going to create inventions for, for that community. And make no mistake, there is no excuse for some of those terrible things that we know people do. There is no excuse for somebody coming in and, and, and harming a coworker or killing a physician. Uh, one of the first cases I worked, certainly within the healthcare system, was at County USC. And some of you may remember back in 1991, um, a fellow was very unhappy with with a number of things. And he, he shot a number of people in the emergency department there at County USC. And um, as much as uh, there, there was a lot of press about that environment, there's no excuse. And there's never an excuse for that kind of conduct. But it also then gives us the opportunity to look at intervention and, and, and steps that we can take to reduce risk. Everyone has not just responsibility for their own behavior, but has an impact on those people around them. So we don't accept or tolerate unacceptable behavior. We share and report information. We take ownership of our behavior and our contributions. So we've got a couple of concepts I, I wanna put out there because again, if, if you ever in a situation when you call Kelly or you email her and, and together uh, you and, and your colleagues are looking at a particular situation, here are some of the concepts that we, we, we want you to kind of have in mind so you understand how we move forward. Number one, there's a very significant difference between someone who makes a threat and someone who poses a threat. And statistically, we know that most people who make threats never go on to hurt anybody. Most people who hurt somebody never made a threat, at least not for quite a while. They may have at the very end game portion of their behavior of, of that pathway. So what it tells us is that we don't want to focus solely on whether or not somebody made a threat. 
we really want to make sure you and your colleagues uh, reach out to Kelly when someone is acting in a way that is reasonably perceived as threatening. And we spend a lot of time on that whole notion because I think we are tasked with addressing three issues. Number one, what is the current immediate level of risk? Number of two, even if it's low risk, with thank God, I, I think 88, 90% of our cases, what we would consider low, moderate risk, even if it's a low risk, is that person engaging in behavior which creates reasonable fear, discomfort, distress? Generally, the answer to that question is, is yes, otherwise we wouldn't have been contacted. So the great challenge is what do we, what do we as a enterprise do to address the inappropriate behavior and not escalate the risk? So we need to understand that since threat is not static, our threat assessment process is ongoing. We assess risk as opposed to investigate a threat. The fundamental difference is investigation is historical in nature. It's backwards looking. Generally we want to um, get enough statements so that we can demonstrate to a certain threshold that this person has engaged in the behavior concern. Our job is not to investigate whether somebody engage in the behavior, human resources, other folks can help us find that out. Risk management works very closely with Kelly. They can engage. Our job is to determine to what extent does this person pose an identifiable risk? And we need to assess under what circumstances would the risk get worse? And under what circumstances would it be reduced? And how do we obviously focus on the latter? A challenge for us and I, I go back to when I was in graduate school back in the 80s. I remember in, in, in psychology, we were taught in many ways, and I'm oversimplifying it, but we were taught that uh, uh, perception is reality. And, and, and no, it's not. Reality is reality. But people act on their perception. And one of the great perceptual challenges we have is that, and in, in, in maybe this is my opportunity to do the old man card and say, you know, uh, uh, this generation, but I think it's been around for decades and decades is that people move very quickly from I'm feeling discomfort, therefore I must be in danger. And if I'm in danger, this person must be dangerous. So therefore they'll go immediately from discomfort to dangerous to fear and, and, and that's not okay. So what these items really want us to do is understand that we will do an assessment of risk. We will create a threat intervention process and protocol based on the, the true elements of that risk. But we also want to address the fear, the perception, and we create two then strategies. How do we manage the potential for violence? And how do we manage the fear that's been created? And even where Kelly and I may say, this is a low risk of imminent attack, physical harm, we respect greatly that that Fear changes us, fear affects us. It affects our relationships, it, it affects our ability to, to work, it affects our health, it goes home and affects our family. So when we say that, that it's not an imminent risk, it doesn't mean that we're minimizing or degrading somebody's fear. What we are saying is that we need to make sure that as a body, we create two very clear intervention strategies. Manage the potential for harm and let's manage the fear that has been created and, and both deserve our attention. Actually, the, another slide that this whole notion of, uh, I've mentioned targeted violence a number of times, um, it's an oversimplification, but in each of these slides, we've got two animals. In one of these pictures, one of the animals in dire danger. And obviously that's the picture on the right, the bird. Historically, whether it's in our clinics, whether it's in our workplace, whether it's within our there the, are other environments. The picture on the left, that behavior gets the most attention. Somebody's yelling, they're screaming, they're making threats. Um, but what we do know about the animal world is the animals make threats because they want to avoid danger. So if one of these cats were to step back, put its ears up, lower its, you know, pull its claws in, the other cat's going to walk away. And the picture on the right, that bird's probably going to get eaten. So how do we as a body make sure that we, we give respect to the, to, to the photo on the left, that we understand that reactive in the moment, spontaneous emotional violence, not good, but it's 
different from that targeted, the person who ruminates, they obsess, they fantasize, um, they, they rehearse all those things. The violence on the left, while very uncomfortable, is rarely lethal, rarely gets to the point of, of extraordinary damage. The one on the left is going to end in, in danger and death. So our objective is to make sure that we as a body with the threat assessment management team get involved much earlier. We actually created this with our campus support and intervention. And while it, it, it really is, is initially focusing on, on how we engage with students, the same principles apply when we engage with employees, coworkers. It looks, it is I think true how we engage with difficult student uh, uh, patients, but throughout the continuum that Historically, Kelly or I would not get called in until somebody's engaging behavior that was alarming or dangerous. We want to be involved much earlier and we work closely with risk. We want to work closely with our clinics. We want to work closely with our, our management teams and, and uh, in, our, in our, our offices so that when there is a situation where someone is becoming difficult and is disruptive, we'd like to hear about it. We'd like to, to know. We truly believe that, that threat assessment folks, we look at things differently. And we want to add that we're not taking the case. We're not overstepping our responsibilities. We're not going to try to come in and, and critique, but we want to add another layer of support for those folks who are tasked with managing it. And that's going to be mostly on the left. It's going to be the clinic, the staff, physicians, the support personnel. Um, how do we manage uh, concern and behavior? And when it starts to move down that's the continuum, we'd like to be involved. Many, many years ago, uh, there's two fellows, 2003, they published uh, this, this thing called a pathway to violence. We've all used the terms in many ways, uh, but Calhoun and Weston first published this. And, and what they really did was they, they identified the fact that when folks are engaging in targeted violence, that it doesn't go from a grievance to an attack without a number of very identifiable behaviors. And so we, we like this, this kind of a, of, of a model because I think it just makes sense that it's not just from anger to attack, but they've got to fantasize, they've got to research. And this can go fairly quickly in some cases, but we're gonna find in most cases, it takes months and months, maybe longer. And if we identify behavior, we intervene, we can deescalate. And that really is our goal, to deescalate the, the, the attack. Now, not related to this slide, but one other thing that Calhoun and Weston brought up, uh, actually they first published it and they brought up the term and they, they, they own now, I think, in the field of threat assessment, we use a term called uh, uh, intimacy effect. When there has been a intimate or prior intimate relationship, and now it's a domestic or a stalking situation, the potential for violence is, is exponentially increased. So when we do our assessment, we look at things like prior intimacy, history of behavior. We, we look at a bunch of things, but what we really wanna do, quite frankly, is take this pathway to violence and move even before the grievance and start looking at disc disconcerting behaviors. Because once somebody is in the pre-attack preparation, the probing, boundary probing, um, they'll, they'll come by surveilling, they'll do those things, it's late. We've got very few options. If we get involved much earlier, we have just a huge range. So back to the first, first slide when I started talking about, uh, you know, no one just snaps. We, we've known that intuitively, anecdotally for decades. And then just a couple of years ago, the FBI published the, this, uh, the study that was remarkable. And they've actually done it, uh, redone it, added a couple more years of data and, and the, the numbers didn't change. What they found is that people who engage in, in active shooter kinds of events, 56% of them were engaging in problematic behavior. They were exhibiting mental health concerns, called troubled and troubling. Troubled is, it's in here. Troubling is when, when my uh, interpsychic kind of distress is, seeking, is seeping out and impacting those around me. They're troubled and troubling. They're problematic. They're scaring folks two full years before the attack. If we ignore the 5% of unknown, we now look at 98% of the folks who engage in targeted attacks are engaging in behaviors concerned a month or more prior to the event. No one just snaps. Now the next slide really becomes fascinating because we, we knew that 
And then the, the MAPS, the Mass Attacks on Public Spaces study that was published by the U.S. Secret Service um, in 2020, said that what they found is when they went back and looked at, at these events was that not only did people know, but maybe more significantly was that the closer to the attacker, the less likely to report. And now we look at friends, classmates, coworkers, research partners. You notice and there's got mental health professionals and clearly then we would include uh, healthcare providers. Um, but the closer to the circle, the less likely to report. So part of our challenge, especially as, as we, we have long-term relationships, is, is to focus on the behavior, to address things early. And we'll look at things like domestic violence and, and uh, we call it leakage. People put things out there, whether it's social media posts or blogging, or they communicate stuff against self-harming acts, um, there's, we're very concerned at the very bottom, you notice the, the suicidal ideation, um, and, and sometimes that door between suicidal and, and homicidal ideation is not a very firm door, that isolation, signs of depression, uh, compliance with medical treatment is really pretty significant as, as, as significant. Now, as you go through these, and maybe the whole slide, there's a couple of things that I really want to reinforce. Number one, very, very few people who engage in behaviors on the left go on to kill somebody. But everyone who killed somebody started there. So part of what our goal is, is to look at our culture. And when a culture, and by the way, I'm taking to medical professionals, you all get this. Our culture is early reporting, is looking at behaviors of concern and saying, this is not necessarily a person on a pathway to homicide or violence, but this is a person in need. This is a person who is uh, expressing um, uh, these challenges and whether they're mental health or, or maybe I would call them subclinical. People leak. These are people who need our intervention. And that's back to the goal of the threat team. We want to intervene meaningfully. We want to intervene significantly. We want to intervene in a way that not just stops that pathway to violence behavior, but hopefully helps address the underlying concerns that lead and, and give food really and, and uh, fuel to these other kinds of behaviors. So conceptually, I, I think you get it. We wanna create a culture and it's not only a culture of care, but a culture of sharing information quickly, reliably, meaningfully. It's a culture that looks at the broader behaviors that engages Kelly and her uh, resources early and a culture that, that if we get involved early enough, we, we, we've got a host of interventions. In our office, we, we truly believe this, that if we're at a point where the only options we have left are things like incarceration, hospitalization, looking at 5150, danger to self or others, um, it, we, we've missed many other opportunities. We'll still intervene there, but we have a host of other options that, that Kelly is going to articulate in a few minutes. So this is where we came, and Kelly's going to talk about what she has now brought. And, and uh, I, I will tell you, almost from the day I started at USC, uh, it was on uh, my list of things that we had to do. We had to have somebody dedicated to our healthcare enterprises, and we are very excited and, uh, and happy that we were able to, to bring Kelly on board. And uh, she's going to now take what I just said and show you how she's applied it to your world. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> so I'll start by just kind of framing um, workplace violence in, in the healthcare industry. The International Association of Healthcare Safety and Security found that healthcare workers are four times more likely to be victims of workplace violence. And we know that the emergency department is the second most dangerous workplace outside of law enforcement. And we also know that workplace violence incidents are, are greatly underreported in the healthcare industry. That when you look at 75% of all of the workplace violence across all sectors, all types of employees, 75% happens to healthcare workers. I think that um, the vast majority of concerns that we have are, are patient driven, um, patient members, other families. The data supports that about 80%. Um, but we can't disregard the other places in our community where we'll see concerns um, and opportunities for violence. Um, in our campus environment, it could be fellow physicians or researchers, students, 
other community members completely unaffiliated. Um, so we really do have to kind of be paying attention to concerns um, that could come from any members of our community. And when we look at healthcare based shootings, uh, I think that this is a type of, of violence that we did, typically didn't see throughout healthcare systems. I think there was a, a bit that we knew about that happened in emergency departments, but I think during COVID that this is a type of violence in our healthcare system that we've really seen skyrocket. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the numbers around this come out. Um, you know, the CDC is, is doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, there are some, some general characteristics. We know that 91% of shooters have been male, but we can't discount female uh, shooters either, uh, given the tragedy in Tennessee. Um, I think that when Patrick and I first started doing this work, the impression was that 18 to 24 year old white males were the ones who, who engaged in this type of violence. And what we see is that it really does span across all age groups. Uh, locally here in Monterey Park, the shooter was 72. In Half Moon Bay, he was 66. So we really do see all age groups um, engaging in this type of violence. The vast majority of shootings result in one victim, and that's not why we're or that's why we're not hearing about them on, on the news. Uh, typically, there has to be a higher body count than the last one before it gets that national attention and really draws that outrage. Uh, so this type of violence is happening more frequently than we're hearing about it in our, our national news media. And as Patrick mentioned, the difference between that targeted and reactive violence, uh, these are generally targeted attacks. Someone has a, a real or perceived grievance or injustice and, and is set on attacking that individual or community. Uh, and we've seen that type of violence double in frequency over the last decade. There are some unique challenges I think that we've experienced during COVID. As, as Patrick mentioned, our office is relatively new to the USC community. Uh, my position's been here uh, about two and a half years. Uh, so I came in during COVID and if you weren't directly impacting patient care, you weren't welcome in a lot of our healthcare spaces. So just letting people know about our services and, and the ways that we can be supportive uh, was difficult during COVID. Uh, in addition, patients uh, didn't have access to, to care and support systems in the, in the way that they did pre-pandemic. Um, some people were moved to telehealth, didn't have access to come in person for physical care. I am a transplant from the East Coast and I have not seen um, the concerns related to unhoused individuals that I've seen since moving to the Los Angeles area, especially in our healthcare environment. We have people coming at all hours of the day and night to and from uh, various facilities on our health science campus that are impacted by unhoused individuals in our area. The changing pandemic protocols, I know we have another new change coming from the state on Monday. It's caused a lot of um, disruption, uh, patient visitors. Bob comes in and is told that he has to wear a mask in the hospital. Well, when he went to Applebee's with his wife last night, he didn't have to wear one, you can't make me. Uh, so I don't know that the state has done a great job with communicating those changing pandemic protocols and, and we're dealing with a lot of addressing that in the healthcare space. Uh, patient terminations, we've seen a, a huge increase in the number of people whose um, behaviors are threatening and harassing, uh, both verbally, verbally harassing and physically harassing to the point where we have to uh, terminate them from care. We've also seen an increased reports of stalking and harassment behavior targeting our healthcare workers. Uh, we can also provide some support for individuals who are experiencing that in an online space. And in the addition of depression, anxiety, and substance abuse um, among our patients and our broader community, we're also seeing it among healthcare workers and our, our coworkers on campus. Um, so paying attention to that, that increase in depression, anxiety, and substance use. And one of the things I love most about healthcare workers is one of the things that is the most frustrating about healthcare workers, and that's commi that commitment to patient care and satisfaction. I think that a lot of individuals in the healthcare space believe that that verbal and physical harassment is just part of the job. And that's what drives a lot of that underreporting is that reluctance to bring those concerns forward um, and get some support from the university in addressing those concerns. And I think a great way to illustrate a lot of what Patrick has, and I have talked about is the Atlanta Health Clinic shooting in Buffalo, Minnesota that occurred in February of 2020. The suspect was 67 years old and a former patient. On the day of the incident, uh, the sheriff's office received reports of shots fired. 
15 rounds, injuring four and wounding, or and resulting in one dead and four wounded. The suspect was taken into custody without incident, although other things were happening during his arrest. Witnesses reported hearing explosions throughout the building. Uh, the suspicious packages at the lobby front desk of the hotel nearby where he was staying and planning his attack. Uh, after the incident, when they went back to kind of look at what led to this event, uh, they found out that the suspect had on and off police contact since 2003. So he, he was known to the law enforcement community. In his relationship with the clinic, he'd had a back surgery in 2018 that led to some chronic pain where he developed a, a pain a pill addiction. Uh, he became very frustrated with his physicians when they would not continue to prescribe his pain medication. And that led to a lot of his grievance with the physicians in the clinic. He threatened to engage in a mass shooting at the clinic. And that eventually led from him to be banned from clinic property in uh, 2018. He continued to harass the physician who was previously treating him to the point where the physician sought and received a restraining order. The suspect ultimately violated that order and he was, <clears throat> the case that was brought forward was dismissed due to his mental incompetency. Shortly after he applied for a purchase or a permit to purchase a handgun and there was a notation from the court clerk highly recommending not to approve that permit, yet somehow it was approved. So even though there are statutes, red flag laws that, um, that state that anyone who has been found incompetent to stand trial should not be a legal possessor of a firearm, uh, this was clearly not applied in this case. Um, another fascinating part of this case was prior to the shooting, neighbors reported that in his front yard, signs that were visible from a nearby highway. I mean, very large signs calling the Alina Health Clinic crooks and making direct threats towards the doctor uh, that no one reported to law enforcement or other authorities. And I think that this case really illustrates a lot of the work that we do in threat assessment and management. It doesn't appear that the Alina Health Clinic had a threat assessment team in place. And it is so crucial that entities like ours, complex healthcare systems and universities have teams as a way to collect the dots, to connect the dots. We call it a central place to collect all of that information and then share it timely with appropriate partners. Uh, psychological evaluations are not a predictor of violence. So even though the suspect in this case had a psychological evaluation, um, it should have prevented him from the firearm. Uh, that would still not have been an indicator of risk. Um, a violence risk assessment is something that is very specialized and should be conducted by a trained clinician um, and is not what we typically get with a normal mental health evaluation. Even though we saw red flag laws in place, um, we cannot rely on them being applied appropriately. And mass casualty incidents are not limited to firearms. Uh, in places where firearms are not accessible, like China, we're starting to see mass stabbings and vehicle attacks um, in a way uh, to impact the same number of, of individuals. Uh, the suspect's brother was interviewed after the shooting. It's not clear if he was aware of the level of concern uh, from the clinic but in a lot of these cases, engaging family members, not only for support, but information um, as someone is, is navigating these challenges can be so important. We have a number of processes for elevating behavioral concerns at the university. Um, in the clinic environment, risk management has SRMs. Uh, we have a number of reporting systems on more of the university side through our Office of Professionalism and Ethics. Um, through our, our students of concern, uh, through our EEO Title IX office. And the more information we can get about an individual during those individual reports, it's so helpful for us. Uh, when we're looking at patients, a name, a date of birth, an address helps us gather so much open source intelligence. Um, it's also very helpful to know what they're being seen for, how long they've been a patient, um, are they being seen by other departments? Do other people have similar concerns? Are there known mental health disorders or other things that may impact the behavior that we're seeing? Do they have support systems, some of those family members or other caregivers that may be able to support the individual? And has the individual been confronted about their behavior? 
Um, one of the things that we've seen is that we live in a very litigious society and we call it the bystander effect. Um, I don't have to worry about it. If that behavior is really concerning, someone else will report it to law enforcement. Somewhere else will bring those concerns forward. Uh, so we, we really don't want to get involved. Um, what we do know is that sometimes an intervention strategy can be as simple as a conversation and having those tough conversations, pointed conversations about behavior can, can often be a deterrent. Uh, and we do know um, that concerns will not only come from patients, uh, they will come from other members of our community as well. So as we're escalating concerns about people that don't fall in that patient group, what is their affiliation with us or with our department or with the university as a whole? What types of um, behaviors have been occurring? Um, how long have those behaviors been occurring? What, what changed today that, that prompted the report? Um, I can't tell you how many cases we have where employees are now afraid to come to a work. No one will be in the conference room with Bob. Well, what happened? Tell me about Bob's behavior. Well, he's aggressive. Well, what does aggressive mean? Well, he throws things when he comes into the office and he threatened to kill everyone last week. Well, how long has this been behavior been going on? About two years. Um, and when we go back and we look at Bob's interactions with HR and others, uh, typically performance reviews have been great, um, no one's addressed the behavior, and people have just kind of been avoiding, hoping it would go away or someone else would have to respond. Um, but typically we find out that these concerns have been going on for a very long time before someone's finally had enough. Um, and the fear and anxiety has written to a, a point where typically they'll contact law enforcement. Um, are there any previous concerns or things that may have triggered, triggered the behavior? Uh, work is where we spend a lot of time, so it's not unusual that we'll know about financial or other crises that may be going on in an individual's personal life that are impacting their work environment. Um, how does that individual get along with other community members? Is this an isolated thing between two individuals or are they engaging in this type of behavior with the broader community? And again, that the confronting specific behavior when it occurs. And when we think about deterrence and intervention strategies, uh, we know that happy, connected individuals do not go on to commit acts of mass casualty violence. Uh, we have a colleague, uh, former Secret Service, who interviewed surviving shooters. Um, and one of the questions, uh, there was a shooter that committed a, an attack at a university in North Carolina. And she said, why'd you do it? And he said, you know, if just one person had stopped me and asked me how I was that day, that would have been enough to stop. Uh, he felt so disconnected and that no one cared even enough to just exchange pleasantries on campus. Just that, that one act of kindness alone would have been enough to prevent his attack. So um, communication and engagement is so important. People feeling connected back to our community, uh, regardless of their role, faculty, staff, student. Um, we talked a little bit before about that parental or familial support. Um, that's very case by case. Sometimes the parent or family member can be driving <laughs> some of that concerning behavior, uh, so we don't engage supports, but it is something that we do consider when we're looking at these cases holistically. Um, spiritual connections, I think, is always interesting. In all of the years that I've been doing this work, um, I've always been housed in a law enforcement agency. USC was the first place that had a very unique model where the Office of Campus and Wellbeing and Crisis Intervention reported to the Dean of Religious Life. <laughs> so spiritual connections was definitely one of the things that we considered in the work that we do here. Behavioral contracts are a fantastic tool, whether we're working um, from HR, working with employees, or whether we're working with patients. It's a way to set clear expectations, set firm boundaries. Here are the behaviors that we will not tolerate generally how they line up with our workplace violence prevention program. And here are the consequences if you continue that behavior, whether that separation is a patient or as an employee, or other sorts of con so consequences if they don't um, continue what they've outlined in those contracts. Mental health interventions. Um, I think that there is a general sense in the media that everyone who engages in this type of violence has a mental health disorder. You know, that one in fives one, of, one in five adults in the US has a diagnosable mental health disorder, uh, the top three being substance use, depression, and anxiety. Um, that's a lot of people. Uh, so we know that having a mental health diagnosis does not, is not a predictor of violence. Um, we do know that mental health interventions can sometimes be supportive when an individual is in crisis. Um, so those are one things that are considered as part of that big strategy, um, but definitely not a, a sole strategy. Uh, health or other administrative leaves. 
discipline or other accountability measures. And as Patrick talked about before in that continuum and that early intervention, if things have come to the point where we're looking at termination of care, hospitalization, or incarceration, it's really too late. Um, the earlier we know, the broader range of intervention strategies that we have, and generally the more positive outcome, not only for the individual of concern, but for our university community as a whole. And the great thing about threat assessment and management is we are an interdisciplinary collaborative group. Uh, we have a group of partners that meets once a week on the UPC side. We're standing up a similar team here on the health science campus of community members uh, university-wide where we can talk about concerns together, we can collect data together, we can develop the appropriate intervention strategies. Uh, generally, if someone is being assessed by our team, they may never know. Uh, they don't typically get called onto the carpet to talk to Pat, but sometimes that happens. We'll typically develop intervention strategies that wouldn't raise red flags or concerns that feel very natural for the persons where we're trying to get them connected with care. Uh, this is not um, an entire list of all of the campus partners that we work with, but this is uh, some of the, the usual suspects. And in addition to our campus partners, we have external partners in the community, uh, state, local, and national law enforcement that we work with as well as, as we're conducting our work. And um, we'd like to leave you lastly with what you can do. Uh, if you see something, say something. Pay attention to your spidey sense. So that's when the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up or something doesn't feel right in your stomach. Um, pay attention. If something's not right, it, it, it's usually not right. And we want you to give us a call. Um, if the situation is urgent, we definitely want you to contact the Department of Public Safety first. Um, they are your first line of defense. Um, if you don't have the Live Safe, Mo Live Safe Mobile Safety app on your phone, I would encourage you to download that today. It's like having a personal panic button wherever you go. If you're in the DPS footprint, you can send a phone call, a text message, a video. It goes straight to DPS dispatchers. They would have your GPS location. If you're using that app outside of our DPS footprint, it still goes to local 911 just without some of that increased functionality. So. It is like having a personal panic button and just good for, for personal safety. If the situation's not urgent, if you're experiencing a concern, you're not sure who to contact, you're not sure where you can go for support and resources, call me anytime. Um, I may not be the right person to help you follow up on a concern, but I have lots of campus partners who can, um, and I'm always available to consult and, and help you work through uh, some of those concerns and make sure that you're safe, you're feeling supported, and that we're taking the appropriate actions to address those concerns. And with that, I will pause because I think we wanted to leave uh, some time for thoughts and questions. Hi, Kelly and Patrick. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. I have a question regarding the behavioral contracts. That that I like that it seems something that puts on paper agreements. I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit more what what they contain and how they have actually helped. So depending on your your role, they'll vary different. We do have kind of templates where we start. So for instance, a patient partnership agreement. If we know that someone is yelling and cursing and being inappropriate with staff when they come in for appointments. Typically, we'll have the physician that's working with them present a contract that says, we have a workplace violence prevention policy that prohibits verbal and physical harassment of our staff. Here are the behaviors that we've observed when you are in our community. Here are the behaviors that must not continue. If these behaviors continue, here are the things that will happen, um, which could lead to termination from care from a patient. Um, same thing, but slightly modified if it's, if it's with a student or a staff member. Very clearly naming what behaviors cause concern and what consequences can be expected. And I think that there are sometimes people are reluctant to have those conversations because, oh, if we can confront the behavior, it's going to escalate things. Um, any behavior that you allow to continue without that boundary or disruptor becomes your new normal. Uh, if someone doesn't know that they're engaging in behavior that causes that level of concern, you're basically giving them the green light to continue <laughs> indefinitely. So that, that boundary setting is such a necessary first step. And then that way, 
all of our offices can pay attention and how that individual responds to that boundary setting, because that's going to tell us a lot. And I think Patrick mentioned um, kind of earlier in the presentation, we don't have knee jerk reactions. We do a lot of investigation and we'll start with the lowest level of intervention first and then continue to reassess and apply new intervention strategies to meet people where they are as we kind of move through that assessment process. So if we wanted to develop a behavioral contract, could we uh, connect with you? Absolutely. Thank you. One of the other things that I th think that you'll find when you do connect with Kelly is that, as she said, you know, we're not going to knee jerk. We'll, we'll work on a script. Um, it's not comfortable. No one likes doing it. it it's, it's, it's not something that we look forward to, but that we know there are certain things that do make it more effective. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I'm struck by, and, and we, I, I've been doing this 30 years, um, is, is how often the majority of our cases, when we sit down with somebody and, and they're upfront with them, we're honest with them, we tell them, most people comply. Most folks are able to. And if they're not, as Kelly said, we can always escalate our, our intervention. We can escalate. We try not to do the big things first for a number of reasons. One, it may not be appropriate. Number two, it, it, um, it may not work. And then, then what do we have left? And it kind of reminds me of the whole you know, restraining order discussion. Uh, I only see a couple faces, so I, I'll, I'll look, but everybody nod yes or no. Do restraining orders protect people? Robert, I see you saying no. It says protective order on top of the page. But having said that and calling you on the spot, we know restraining orders do some interesting things. They uh, allow law enforcement to react more quickly, allows law enforcement to maybe take away guns. It does allow certain things to occur. And we know, for example, in domestic cases, 37% of women who are murdered by a domestic partner are killed within 72 hours of getting a restraining order. And some people would argue compellingly that the restraining order might have gotten them killed. And they're probably right. So I think using that as an example just shows, do we get a restraining order? I don't know. Let's put it on the table. Do we engage in a behavioral contract? Let's put it on the table. We'll put a lot of things on the table. And then from that menu of options, let's pick what has the most likely chance of success and let's reassess the risk. And I think that was one of the things I, I tried to say earlier. And, and I just, you know, it's worth saying again, when you connect with Kelly, then it's not a, you know, come and give her opinion and move on to the next. It, it's reassessing as interventions are applied. Did it get the Is it having unintended consequences? And we can not only reassess risk, but we can then reassess the intervention approach. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Sorry, Robert. <laughs> are there any other questions or thoughts or, or, or concerns? I'm wondering if anyone who's here has any example or any, yeah, an example of something that that may have happened and and didn't know what to do. Um, we actually had a, a situation, um, one of our research teams, um, where it was actually, uh, we had some research findings we published that uh, resulted in some politically charged discussion. Um, and we actually, um, one of my co-authors uh, received some direct threats over email um, to her USC affiliated email address. It's, it's not hard to figure out what our email addresses are, you know? Um, so, um, and we actually, what we ended up doing um, was the PI on the study reached out to your office um, for some guidance on what the next steps to do were and, and did an assessment and it turned out it was someone who had sent many similar letters off to other people was not a, actually a targeted, um, you know, a targeted thing at, the, at, at our team in particular, we just came across this, you know, massive number of emails this person was sending out every day. Um, and so it was really helpful to have that, um, you know, your investigative tools to be able to look into that um, and was reassuring. Um, and I think that, you know, we didn't know, we didn't even know your office existed to be frank at first, you know, and so now we, now anytime I've heard about anything, I've, I've let people know that your office is fantastic. Um, but I think that that was 
um, a situation where, you know, it was very scary when it first started. Um, and uh, it's, you know, kind of figuring out the next steps are difficult when you're already in kind of a fearful situation like that. We appreciate that. I, I think one of the, and Kelly alluded to it, it's a different world. And I think people have lived in an echo chamber for years where, you know, it's, it, it, this kind of discourse is, is normative. And, um, and we have a number of our researchers who have gotten on notoriety or for lack of a better term and, and uh, people with nothing else to do have identified. We had one faculty member who was getting literally thousands of, of emails. They, they were highlighted on Fox and Breitbart and Infowars and some of those things. And we, we looked at each one. And, and so while we know statistically the mass majority of folks what we call keyboard warriors, um, our commitment is we'll, we'll still look at each one and we look for changes in, in frequency, intensity, duration. Um, is it, you know, I don't know who it was that was uh, sending those, but we have one guy who likes our faculty, Bone Crusher Bob. So, you know, we, we get those. And having said that, each time Bob sends something out, we still go back and, and, and we look at it um, because it is scary and it is alarming. And, and in one particular case, the fellow who's getting thousands of emails, we did work with our outside partners and um, we did in this one particular situation, it became clear to us that, that this was not a, a keyboard warrior. This person was moving on that pathway to violence, was approaching USC and uh, fortunately worked with the FBI and local law enforcement. He's arrested. In addition to having stolen a police officer's uniform, he had a lot of meth and he had a, his swastika tattooed on his, on his stomach. A lot of, lot of clues, uh, but, but we were able to intervene and, and get him deterred from, from coming to our, our campus. So we can, we can do some pretty significant interventions. We prefer the lower ones. We prefer the meet and, and discuss and, and negotiate with folks. Um, but we have no compunction about uh, doing, doing more if we need to. We certainly don't mind that. And I think one of the challenging things is that um, we're so connected to our, our online presence um, as researchers and having forward-facing positions at the university, there's this expectation that we will be accessible and we want to share our work and in really good things, which um, most of the time is great and wonderful. Um, but then there is uh, that smaller piece where someone, most of the time without even a legitimate concern, will say or, or target someone in our community and um, really come after them, those keyboard warriors online. And, and thankfully, most of the time, um, that, that's where it ends and the likelihood that it will move um, in vivo from online into an in-person environment is, is very small. Uh, but as Patrick said, we do have lots of tools and resources um, to help make those assessments and provide support. Um, if you are worried about your online presence and would like to minimize the amount of personal information that you have available, uh, we do have some tools for your toolbox uh, and in training that we can provide uh, if that's an assessment uh, that you'd like to, to think about. We're at time, but I was just wondering, do, do you have any um, workshops or anything where, where you do train people in this? In the threat assessment, no, we were connected with organizations that do. And so we're very uh, in, encouraging of folks to join. And, and uh, we do have some of our, our colleagues there at Health Science Campus, the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, a big one. Actually, IAHSS is, is a very uh, reputable one. And I, I need to acknowledge Kelly has been uh, asked to be their subject matter expert on a task force they're creating to look at hospital uh, healthcare violence. And so we, we, we have colleagues in those areas and so we're happy to share that with you. And then we can do more specific ones if there's something that's particular to a, um, a clinic or an office, we can come in and, and moderate something, you know, create something of, uh, from this. Yeah, and so as, as Kelly mentioned, we do a lot of work trying to make it hard for people to find our researchers. You have to have that forward facing presence, as Kelly said, but they don't have to know where your kids go to school. And, um, and so the things that uh, our, our colleague Ben Callen has been working very hard to put together a nice package and, and we can do that as a group as well. And I think that um, 
our partners also have some complimentary trainings that are, are useful in this space. So uh, generally, it's easier to get people to come to a run, hide, fight, and active shooter type presentation than to talk about threat assessment and management, because I guess it just sounds more exciting. Um, but we, we try to leverage that where we can. Um, also things like verbal de-escalation. So if that kind of training, learning how to talk to people, de our DPS partners have a, a great training for that, and we're happy to make those connections too. That would be great. Well, thank you so much. My friends, we appreciate you. Um, it's nice I look around, I recognize a couple names and, um, and for the ones we don't know, um, uh, Kelly and I hope to, to get to know you and uh, you'll, you'll find that it, we, we appreciate the calls when you're not sure. Um, we don't really know how to articulate the threshold. So where we are, our, our default is, if you're feeling something's uncomfortable and you're just not sure, you've reached the threshold. And we're very okay with that. And we're very comfortable responding and, and working with you. And as Kelly said, if we're not the right folks, we were very good at finding who is. And, and we, we don't mind that. So thank you all very much for what you do. We appreciate you and, um, and uh, give Kelly a call. Bye, thank you. Thank you.